What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. Dead Meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're a boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, and we like to see movies late. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, kind of late at night, and also <laughs> three weeks late. Yeah, we're a bit late on this one. We're looking at Pet Cemetery, yeah. the new one. I was looking at a movie to do for this week, and then I thought... People keep asking me what we think about this, and we hadn't seen it yet. So let's just make this an episode. Yeah, normally when we do movies that are still in theaters, they're like bonus Bonuses, episodes. But, but you know what? We got a schedule thing going on. We're getting into the busy time of year with conventions and stuff. So just, you know, just deal with us. We just gave you two research-heavy episodes. <laughs> uh, so this one is The only is difference is I won't that. be able to put in clips. That's it. Because I'll be comparing this to the old movie for sure. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with it, making the kill count for it. Uh, I also read the book, so I'll probably be one of those annoying people who compares it to the book. That's fine. I want you to. I, I hate not having read the book. It's a I, very I feel, good Stephen King book. I feel very vulnerable mm-hmm. doing this review. I have an incomplete picture of the adaptation. Yeah, because you saw the original movie a while ago. Yeah. Like a year ago, maybe. Yeah, I hadn't seen it. I, I never saw it. That was one I just never watched yeah so and you've seen it once yeah that's all you need to see it man yeah same thing with this movie yeah it's uh yeah just to say up top i guess how we feel before we get into it deeper uh i'll say that i did think this was better than the original film mm-hmm. which may be a controversial opinion but maybe not i don't know i think it might be a little controversial eh, people whatever. like that old one I yeah. don't really. It's not. <laughs> I don't think it's, it's not a good, good movie. I mean, this one's not great. Yeah, and but... I have a lot of the same problems with mm-hmm. this that I do with the old one. Yeah, and I think so. While watching this movie, I was mostly thinking about it in terms of comparing it to that original adaptation, and that's the thing. This is another one of those situations where it's like it, where it's not. I wouldn't call this a remake of the original no, film. No, because you can readapt something. Yeah, it's yeah, different yeah, yeah. than just remaking a movie. He, like, you're working off of a book, same mm-hmm. as the other. Yeah, like you wouldn't call the Shining miniseries a remake of the movie. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Uh, also, I think a caveat that we need to say is every time you see a movie. Depending on your set and setting, you're going to have a different experience. And we saw this in the theater, one, with some cool new friends. Uh, I don't know if we should be pimping up. We hung out with Matt Pat and his wife, Stephanie, Matt, and they're fucking such quality people. Yeah, they're they're good. Yeah, it was my second time hanging out with them, but I'd, I'd call them friends now because we click so well. We're going to hang out with them more. So that was great. Yeah, you know what's cool to do with people you just met, though, especially new friends you've made who you knew are like, we know they're new parents, is take them to see Pet Cemetery. Oh, God, I didn't even think <laughs> about that. Holy shit. Stephen King is called this I was, the scariest book I was he's ever written. I was very aware of it. It's like the movie started, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is a movie where a little kid gets killed by a drug. Holy shit. <laughs> oh, I want to talk to them about that. I can't believe I did. I <laughs> they knew what they were getting themselves yeah, into. Yeah, they knew. They definitely were But that's familiar. how we make friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. No, they were fantastic. I love them. Yeah. The rest of the people in that theater. Good Lord. Holy shit. Dude, before the movie starts, the guy in the seat next to me had his girlfriend lay on his lap head in lap i thought they i was were in see a my dick. periphery the whole time and i it almost looked like she was half laying on you i'm like what is happening it was over- close it was like she was spread out across all these seats and i was worried about something i was so worried on. i was gonna see a dick out of the corner of my eye honestly i, I pulled w- that move in a theater i would before. be less annoyed by that even if just like a full dick comes out, I'm less annoyed by that than the fucking people talking. Yeah, they were the worse. entire movie. I don't care. Like, get your dicks out of the theater. <laughs> Whatever. Just do it quietly. Just do it quietly. Don't make noise. <laughs> I don't care. And don't have your phone out, I guess. Yeah, but there were a trio of teenage boys in the far back corner of the theater too. So if they were, clo- I wish they, they were, were sitting closer, closer. I yeah. would have been like, hey. Shut up. But then there were there were people right behind us too who wouldn't shut the fuck up. But then I always think there's there's been news stories about people who go to shush someone in a the theater and someone pulls a gun out on them. I don't want because that. Because we live in America. 
America <laughs> where you can just bring guns to the movie theater. Yeah, so we just sat there and gritted our teeth, the but thing. it definitely affected I, my Yeah, I'm a experience. little worried that my review is colored by yeah. how annoyed I was the whole time. So just be aware of that. If we're saying something that sounds like we didn't enjoy something and you saw the movie and you're like, wait, no, that was good. Maybe it's because we had jackasses in our theater. Shitty ass mood the whole time. <laughs> God. God damn. Oh, well. I don't know. I, I mean, I've already given a little bit of an overall impression, but I think... You were saying something, and it was something that like you read online, but a comparison to Hereditary. Yeah, I can't um, take credit for this insight at all. I was reading a discussion thread about this movie, and I thought that this was so spot on. Um, and yeah, now we're going to spoil it, so get oh, out if yeah. you haven't seen it. Yeah, get the fuck out of here um, if you care about spoilers and haven't seen the movie. Although I did spoil it earlier, whatever. What, kid getting hit by a car? Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that. <laughs> That's true. Okay. <laughs> We're spoiling this version now. Yeah, there Um, are differences. There are. So I was reading uh, a review of it by someone who was saying that... So Pet Cemetery, and again, I haven't read the book, but you have. And you were devastated by that book. And everyone... Like, when I read reviews of that book, it seems like that book just destroys people. Yeah. Like, it's it seems like it's very heavy. I know Stephen King thinks it's the scariest thing he's ever written. It's... It's a book about grief and how random tragedy is and how random life is. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, like it's a whole book about grieving parents. And so when you get this movie and you just like earlier, or like a year ago, we got Hereditary, which was like that was a stunning movie about grief. And that affected me. And I felt that. It's it's gonna be hard to top that for sure, but the fact that that was put out there is like this is the potential a horror movie can have when we're talking about grief and when we're dealing with a grieving parent. This just I I was not affected yeah. by this at all, and it's it's again it sounds like the feelings I came away with from Hereditary are. Those are the kinds of feelings you have after reading Pet Cemetery. They're like the same core human emotions that. Yeah, I I just wasn't getting in this, and so it's it sucks knowing that that potential was there. It's there in the source material. Hereditary did it so well. This just didn't no. at all. And uh, like I said, when I watched this film, uh, I think we just saw it last night. Yeah. Well, I, I was comparing it to the original the whole time, and so I felt more favorably towards it. But as soon as uh, we started discussing it afterward, and you mentioned hereditary which you're right does i mean spoilers for hereditary does deal with grief and the loss of a child right and so it's it's not unfair to make that comparison with that Mm -hmm. subject matter and maybe with the intended tone we can talk about tone with this movie a little more but uh you make that comparison and this movie just feels like garbage then because it yeah you're right it, it doesn't feel you don't feel that weight and when you make that comparison, to me, Pet Cemetery, uh, you know, the 2019 version, feels like it's too safe uh, to, to get into the heaviness that Hereditary has. And I know it might be weird to call a movie with a little girl getting hit by a semi-truck uh, a safe movie. <laughs> yeah. But it, do- it does feel like a kind of more commercial uh just studio safe version of those feelings and tales and it doesn't i don't know it doesn't let you steep in it and it yeah. doesn't let you dwell in it and that's the other thing that i feel like this movie has a problem with that i said when i talked about the original film because i felt the same way about that one for some reason with both of the pet cemetery films it just feels like you're going from plot point to plot point to plot point And like you're just on these rails and it's like we just have to get to the next thing that happens. And I don't know why it feels – because all movies are are that. that. (laughs) They're plot points that you get to. But for some reason, these two Pet Cemetery movies just feel like there's – I don't know. They're just stuck on a track and you just know – and maybe it's because of the familiarity of the story and we have all we all know the story and we've seen this stuff in different versions. I I don't know. I think both versions of it, you don't get a good sense of – like emotionally where everyone is because we're so intent on we have to get to stuff I think maybe that's 
it, it could be a studio thing because like you said it does feel very like studio horror movie where mm-hmm. it's all the scares are jump scares too there's yeah. not much to it creatively which sucks um <laughs> And I don't want to blame the actual creative team, especially since I know the two directors. They've done like one movie before this. They did Starry Eyes, which um, that was in 2014. That's like a horror movie about Hollywood. And I guess it's very good. I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. But they, I think they're newer. And I, I would, I 100% think that they maybe could have wanted to do certain things and maybe I, I could believe they wanted to, to go a little harder with this movie, but the studio is, you know, one, they're newer directors kind of inexperienced and you- two, it's a Stephen King property. We need it to like, we, we have to have it broad appeal. It needs to make money. That's fair because you know? yeah, if you're a new director, you do not have power. No, I know no, that everyone no. thinks the director <laughs> no. is like the driving force behind no. a movie, maybe for established directors, but if you're a new director, you are answering so many people producers and studios chief among them and like you just said we're we're on the heels of it mm-hmm. smash hit everyone wants a piece of that everyone wants to to replicate that success that's why we're seeing so many Stephen King adaptations now and uh yeah that's a really good point these new directors maybe if they wanted to do something different they weren't allowed to yeah but it's weird because if they wanted to go for the kind of it um if they wanted to maybe recreate that success I, I think what it did so well is it was funny and yeah, it's, there's a lot of plot crammed into that movie, but you still get the emotions of like, that's also a movie about grief and the guilt of, of um, having a loved one die and feeling like you could have done something. And that movie, I got that. And this, uh, not so much. Yeah. And granted it had a lot more screen time to work with. Yeah, uh, I would, I could, I would not be able to handle this movie if it was any longer. Though. I know. Yeah, it, was, it, it felt too long. For as much as we're complaining about there just being a ton of plot <laughs> smushed in here, it felt so long. Yeah. Also, uh, kind of off topic, but I, I haven't really addressed this anywhere else, and I feel like maybe I can now. I did a trailer react video to this trailer and I just want to address it because I know that when that came out, there were some comments on the video saying James said he would never do a video like this. And yet here it is. Listen, it was a, it was a, a paid job, which isn't like a secret or anything. And when they first recorded me reacting to the trailer, I did it the way that I would do it with you. Like we did with the Halloween. I was making my quips. I was doing my jokes and then they they were like, okay, that was good. Can you do it again just with, like, bigger reactions? And so I would give, like, one or two of those but still try to do some new jokes and quips. And they are like, cool, do it one more time with, like, even bigger. And then guess what they edited together, man? Because I didn't edit that one. Yeah. It was all the big things. So I just – I feel bad because it feels like a betrayal of who I am and the Dead Meat brand. And when I saw those comments calling me out, I was like – Oh, fuck. They're right, man. Oh, and man. It really hurt. But, I mean, that kind of goes to show you think that certain people have con- like control and <laughs> power you over, go. you know, you were in. I'm, And again, I don't know the behind the scenes of this movie, yeah, but just I just guessing. always I just always assume the studio is going to come in and, and be all like me. <laughs> you know, we have to play it safe just in case. Speaking of which, though, with the trailer. Holy shit. I, oh, I don't know of a single movie that's been more ruined by a trailer than this one. Yeah. Because this movie does, it's aware of the original film and it tries to do some some different things while at the same time acknowledging that a bunch of the audience will also be familiar with that. And so it tries to, you know, swerve, like literally a swerve with the semi truck because it makes you think it's going to hit Gage just like in the original, but no, he gets scooped up and it hits Ellie instead. That but that's in been, the fucking trailer. That would have been so crazy to not know going into it. Yeah, and similarly, near the end, when Judd is looking for zombie Ellie, and there's a shot of his heel underneath the bed, and you're like, oh, in the original, this is when he gets his heel sliced. And then he, like, moves the bed, and she's not there. Too bad the, there's literally the shot in the trailer of her slicing his heel on the stairs, so you know it's going to happen on the oh. stairs. Like, holy shit, trailer, you literally gave away the entire fucking movie. Yeah. Except for that last shot with the fucking family walking Whose up. Whose idea to... was that? I don't know, because that I think can we can go into the tone of this movie. Yeah, where it feels like there was a lot of inadvertent humor here. 
it could also be again there were two directors mm -hmm. which i don't ever think is a great idea <laughs> I don't... unless they're siblings yeah unless yeah, they're they the like... wachowski sisters mm -hmm. what are we doing <laughs> That could be part of it. I'm, again, I'm projecting like a lot of, I'm guessing what I think could have happened. Yeah. I don't actually know. I have no idea. This is a movie about grief, but then you have these weird, funny moments that just don't, or are they supposed to be funny? I don't know. That's the thing with these because like. And again, our audience sucked and was laughing at everything. And yes, it was just, I couldn't tell. Yeah. I mean, some things I would laugh at, but yeah. then, yeah. There's those jackasses there, in the back. Yeah. But I, I don't know. It's a lot of it comes from uh, uh, the lead actor. It was Jason Clark. Who yes. you just saw. I, as... I just watched Chappaquiddick, yeah. which I thought was very good, if a little dry. But he was Ted Kennedy in that. I thought he was really good. He's, I mean, we all know how I feel about the actor from the <laughs> yeah. original film. Uh -huh. This guy, did, you know, he did a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, a lot of his reactions and stuff. I don't know if if that's a directing thing because yeah it's just some of them are weirdly funny yeah and that's what kills me is the whole ending of this where the the, the daughter who it's the daughter instead of gage it's mm -hmm. ellie mm -hmm. um when she comes back and it's he's brushing her hair and shit and is trying to pretend everything is normal and he's having these moments where He's so trying to keep it together that it comes off as very f comedic because everything is so weird. But I, I feel like in another movie, those moments are really sad and yeah. really disturbing. And they're not here. They're, no. They're kind of funny. They're, they're like a sketch comedy thing. It kind of, yeah. Yeah. Like, I could see our buddy Nick in this role. <laughs> it's just like trying to straight man, like... Mm -hmm. You know, no, it's totally our daughter. Um, <laughs> it, I, one of the moments that stands out to me is when after church gets hit and judge shows him the body and then he's like, go, go trick or treat with your daughter. We'll take care of this tonight. It's got to be done tonight. And like he turns back to John's like, OK, and he, he <laughs> says it in like the weirdest way. Yeah. And like, wh wh what? Yeah. I wrote down a few of his lines. I want to see if I can. Oh, yeah. There's a whole bunch. There is a line that was intentionally uh, funny when uh, Church comes back and after he has told his wife that Church was dead. Oh, yeah. And she's like, good thing you're not a fucking vet. I did laugh at that. I laughed at that. I was pretty I good. I that, yeah. His wife played by Amy Simitz, uh, who was just... On the kill count in Alien Covenant. Mm -hmm. She was uh, Danny McBride's wife in that movie. And I didn't realize she's married to Shane. Is it, I don't know if it's Kareth or Caruth. Oh, but he know. made Primer. Oh, God. And she's in Upstream Color, too, which I haven't seen yet. But that's his other movie that came out a couple of years ago. I wonder if you also need a flow chart to follow that one. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Honestly, I'd be disappointed if you didn't. <laughs> that's that's kind of what I want when I'm watching one of his movies. Yeah. Yeah, I will say most of the rest of the cast and crew... Those are not hyperlinks on Wikipedia, speaking to like how new all these mm -hmm. people are. There, there's a lot of unknowns. Mm -hmm. Good thing they got Lithgow. Yeah. Can we talk about that whole Lithgow One, I will, situation? I will never be satisfied with the lack of a main accent here. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's so, like, that's in the book. But I think they chose not to do it because you're, you're just going to compare it to Fred Gwynn. Which is a great fucking performance. It is. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's why they didn't do it. It's but it's like, part of the. It's like integral to the character. It it because like it helps reinforce the fact that Lewis and his family are so they're such not outsiders. From there. Yeah, that they're in this like place that's so foreign to them that even like the people sound different. Mm. You know, which I guess wasn't really ha that they actually left a lot out in this movie that I think works. They didn't go into uh the the strife between him and his uh in-laws, like Rachel's parents. That's a whole big thing in the book and in the original movie how much like Rachel's dad hates him. Mm -hmm. That like it's very just subtextual in this remake. And then there's another thing that I got to commend them for is just in the book um nor uh Judd's wife Norma is a character and she's one of the most depressing parts because she like is old and sick and then dies and they have to deal with that grief and when she dies that leads Ellie to like 
questioning about death. In the original film, they get rid of that character, but they still want to have Ellie question about death. And so they introduce this random, I don't even know if you remember her. She's like a housekeeper. Her name is Missy. I do. Yeah. yeah. And she's in like two scenes and she hangs herself. And it's just such a like forced in thing just to get Ellie to like ask about death. And I like that in this movie, they don't even bother with that. They just have her ask about death after seeing the pet cemetery. That makes sense. It, makes it sense, streamlines yeah. it. Good job, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, um, in in the book, and I, again, I feel like that original movie. I was barely watching it. it it's, slow. <laughs> it's slow. It's not. It's not yeah. my thing. If you love it, fine. But I was not into it. Um, is Norma? Does Does Judd ever bury Norma in the pet summit? Is that a no. thing? No, okay, no, that no. does not happen. That does not happen. Okay, he's more sensible than all that. Okay, <laughs> good. And that's another thing, as long as we're comparing stuff, is I do think this movie, this remake, we'll just call it that for shorthand, uh, did a better job of establishing and showing how involuntary it is to bury someone in the pet cemetery. Uh, you feel... You I disagree. I yeah. was confused. But as someone who... And, you know, it's much more present in the book where you can have people's internal monologues about, like, them trying to fight off this desire. Uh, in the original film, it's not there at all. Mm -hmm. But in this film... Like, they go to Barry Church in the regular pet cemetery, the storefront pet cemetery, as I like to call it, mm -hmm. as opposed to, like, the oh, drug the operation. Oh, the money laundering. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Exactly. Uh, and they're, they're about to dig a grave, and then Lithgow hears, like, voices and stuff, and is like, uh, all right, come with me. And then later he tells Lewis that, like, uh, was it it's something like the sweetest it'll, it'll make up like the sweetest sounding excuses to go back to that place once you know the power of it mm. so with that I'm like cool they at least show a little bit that it has some kind of supernatural pull which is like very present in the book yeah I don't <laughs> know if I got that a hundred percent yeah I, I was it, looking for it yeah, yeah. I think because you'd read the book yeah I think if you're looking for it it's different than like I, I was wondering because I, I think Judd in the movies is a weird character. Yeah, you said that last night. <laughs> I just don't get his whole thing. I'm, I'm sure in the book it makes so much more sense because you actually get to spend time with him. But I just always feel he immediately comes off as so sinister to me, even though he is a sweet old man. I think in this movie he does. Because it's John Lithgow. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't help. The fucking Trinity killer. He's Dexter. just, yeah. And he's also Lord Farquaad. Yep. <laughs> I just, he's such a villain to me. Even playing Winston Churchill. <laughs> oh, with that with, fucking... Oh, that joke. Did you not like it? It was it was fine. I thought it was fine. Yeah. yeah if you don't know, he played Winston Churchill. Did he the win crown. the Oscar for it? No, he it plays nominated. him in The Crown. Oh. Gary Oldman played him in Darkest You're Hour. You're right. I'm sorry. And he did win for that. Okay. But Lithgow did play Churchill in an Oscar-nominated movie? In The Crown. The yeah. The Netflix series. Oh, in The Crown. Duh. That's right. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a line where Ellie's like, my cat's named after Winston Churchill. And he's like, oh, I know. I know Winston Churchill. <laughs> I, I did like John Lithgow in this movie, but I think it's, it's yeah, it's hard for me to shake his, how I perceive him as an actor. And then you have this guy who shows up and the mom is kind of freaked out she by it. Like, it's weird. And so I'm thinking, is he a villain? I can't really tell. I mean, he's not the villain, but he just... And I, so I never, I, I don't think either version of this story has explicitly made clear what his deal is. Like, why, why, like, why is he so intent on burying the cat there? I, I just think it would, I think this story would work for me a little bit. Like, I think it would click more if we got to spend more time with Judd. And really understand that this is a lonely old man. Mm -hmm. You kind of get that. And you get that he had a wife who died. But I just want to know more about him. And I almost think a movie adaptation that would work better for me is just making Judd the main character. That's Yeah, you said that. That's interesting. Yeah. And so we spend time with him. And we get to know this really lonely old man who's grieving. And then he has his family move in next door. And his grief and attempt to 
fill that kind of hole by, oh, I can, I can, I can't fix my grief, but I can fix this little girl's grief who lives next door and that'll give me some closure. Mm -hmm. But that attempt to like subvert death is what like causes all of it. I just think having him as the main character in a movie might work a little better instead of having this family be the main character. And then there's this weird dude who shows up who <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to trust him or not. And you I feel the same way about Fred Gwynn, Judd. Yeah. I don't get like, I, I, I think it's a weird character <laughs> because especially in that one, because you don't get that he's being, he's being beckoned by the pet cemetery. And I didn't quite get that in this one either. Mm -hmm. Like now that you explain it, I'm like, okay, I see that he was, and he does say like, yeah, you keep thinking of reasons to go back. But I, I don't know. I didn't really buy that. He was so compelled to do it. I thought maybe he was, they were burying church and then he hears noises and he was like, oh yeah, there is a spooky part of this. Like, you know what? Let's give that a try. That's kind of what I would. Okay. I, I read that as, okay. And that's why I wrote what the fuck Judd in my notes because then he acts all sorry about it later. Got it. All and right, I just think so it's weird. Filmmakers in 10 years, when you remake this movie again, because we are incapable of coming up with new ideas, apparently nowadays, uh, keep that in mind, uh, make yeah, it more make clear that, yeah, he's being compelled. To yeah. Do make him the main character so we can get in his head and really <laughs> get that he is being compelled by the pet cemetery and he is going to try and like fix his grief by fixing this other family. And then we watch him deal with the fact that he has basically just pushed this domino over that tears this family apart. Cool. That's my, that would be my take on Pet Cemetery. Yeah. I would like to talk about briefly the Indian burial ground aspect of this movie, since we oh, did yeah. do an entire episode about this concept. Uh, I think thumbs up with what they did in this movie because the burial ground itself, it's not an Indian burial ground. Right. It's just a, a place with uh, powers that they do break out a book of like Northeastern native tribes. And, but the, the connection there is that the native people uh, who were there before, you know, colonization, everything, there are records of them, having recognized that a separate power uh, resided here and that they didn't want anything to do with it and left the area because of it and built that deadfall to keep people out. The, the powers of it have nothing to do with the native Americans themselves. Mm. It's just kind of like recorded history that they were aware of this, that they were present and aware of it. So in the book, is it more like it's, it was their kind of, I don't remember yeah, that aspect in the book because we didn't really. I, I I wasn't thinking through that lens when I, I read see, the book. Okay. You know, I I would yeah be looking out I'd for it more now. I'd say it's better than the kind of standard explanation of oh it was a burial ground they yeah, buried the their dead here ground. blah 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 but mm. I don't know it still effectively was the same kind of trope. I don't think it is because like it's not the mystical other. It's not uh oh the. The uh, spiritual, mystical Native Americans had something that caused this thing to happen. It's more of just like there's there's other powers out there in the world that uh, have been discovered by people all throughout history, like including the natives who were here before of us. Them experiencing it and leaving. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it was I think it was handled pretty well. Yeah, I again like I can't make that judgment call. Sure, yeah. Um, I wonder, cause then there's the Wendigo to or Wendigo. The Wendigo. Yeah. Yeah. But that's like, I think Algonquin mythology. So then it's, you get into like, but still, aren't we kind of effectively doing the same thing where you're still, these are like, you're making invisible native American characters that you're using just as like set dressing a hmm. little bit. I think, yeah, making it so that they, it wasn't, yeah, they're kind of like, oh, spooky native magic is what did it. And they're just kind of, they experienced this and got the fuck out of there. And it, it makes it, you, it makes you remember that, oh yeah, America is actually really old. We yeah. just, yeah. But yeah, I think you know, thinking back to that Indian burial grounds episode, you're still effectively doing that thing where 
you make it almost seem like those people don't exist anymore. Like they just oh, are okay. people who existed in the past and aren't around anymore. And in your story, they're serving as just kind of set dressing to make your story creepy. Hmm. And I feel like they could have, you know, done, they could have had like a settler colony there. Maybe yeah, but is that better off. than acknowledging that this land did have natives on before and now they you could have you could say both you could have both i don't know i'm i'm just throwing ideas around sure yeah yeah i don't think again i'm not like i'm not like mad or like so <laughs> offended it's just yeah thinking back to that episode i'm like yeah okay but it's i think it's at least a step in the right direction sure. from mcmac burial grounds bring your fucking yeah, yeah, yeah. animal back it does suck though that like in that episode we were talking about the trailer and and joey was like oh it's cool i think they're kind of moving away from like the native spiritualism side of it when you know like that was still that was still there and it still was kind of a another take on that trope so yeah i don't know i don't know i i, I can't we, yeah we're just sitting here talking we, we don't know mm-hmm. we're not qualified <laughs> yeah. yeah uh kids and masks Anything to say about them kids in masks? They were a big part of the trailer. I thought that, see, I thought the kids in the mask, going back to my idea of like maybe maybe taking it away from, from like native mythology, I thought they were really tweaking the magic of the, the cemetery. And I thought it was going to be some long, weird, um, like there's some, not cult, but there's some kind of pagan oh. magic or something. And that's like a kind of weird, like that's the remnants of it. Okay. You know, it's lo- It's now just kind of local lore that's been passed down. And that's why these kids feel compelled to, to do that is because it's some weird remnant of what used to go on here. That is why... It's all magic and scary, but no, it's just kind of creepy kids and masks. It's just creepy Which kids and masks. I think that's maybe why I, I felt more disappointed with the the like not burial ground, but just the backstory of the cemetery is that they didn't bring in that the kids at all or the masks or the kind of ritual feeling of it, the procession. I thought there was going to be more of a yeah, there's there's something creepy about that to me, and we didn't really get more of it. Yeah, our buddy Joel also saw this movie, I think the same night as us, but said that, uh, yeah, one of his problems with it was that no rules were established, and that's a really good point. Uh, you know, obviously you have the rule of, like, you go, you bury the thing, and then it comes back to life, and it's yours, whatever. But you get uh, Rachel having these images of her dead sister zelda from childhood yes how's that tie in i that you know? is an issue i had it, it it's just an issue se- i had with this and it's an issue i had with the other one where i get i get that it's it's her again it's it's the guilt over a loved one dying and it's her like issues and it's with her, death and, stemming and, from yeah that. and her feeling like she should have done something or she could have done something but why is she borderline hallucinating you know i wanted more of a yeah uh at the risk of sounding repetitive and annoying in the book uh it i think it's played off as earlier yes it's her just grief and guilt over the death of her sister and later when she does start to see hallucinations and stuff it's during the much more established part of like the the burial grounds actually have kind of tangible power in this universe and will project things and influence things in order to get people to bury things there and to keep other people from stopping them. And so like the power of the burial ground actually like causes flat tires and stuff just to try to keep Rachel from getting back and stopping Lewis from burying things there. And Mm. it's projecting images of her sister to like scare her away. And the counter force there is fucking, uh, what's his name? Uh, Pascal, Victor Pascal, who is much more present in the original film to a detriment. (laughs) Yeah. Is that the one where he sees him on a plane? Yeah. He's like sitting in a plane with this fucking gym shorts and he like helps her book a flight. And he's like, I think this flight has a open seat. Yeah. He's not as present in this 2019 version, Uh which is probably, I would take him not being as present over the goofy ass injection at the end of the last movie. Uh, but yeah, he kind of serves as this like 
just a uh, good spirit trying to counteract the force. It's Stephen King. It's nebulous magic. It's that magical realism that isn't always explained, which is fine in book form. I think it works better in film form. It's a little bit like, is this just here to be creepy? Like a lot of the Zelda stuff just felt like you're just trying to have a boo scare. Mm-hmm. And I do like, I do like that. They changed uh, her death to coming down, the, falling down the dumb waiter. Yeah, what? Was that like? Is it's there a scary. dumb waiter in the book? <laughs> no, is she, she just chokes oh, on the food. Is that character supposed to be super wealthy? The uh, Rachel, like in her family. Yeah, yeah, she comes from money. Okay, because yeah. if you have a dumb waiter in your house, you're rich. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, yeah, sorry. I'm like, oh, this rich kid got a dumb waiter. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, she definitely comes from money. Uh, a dumb waiter's scary, though. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, like, I thought that that was effective, uh, more effective use of a dumb waiter than. Uh, Fucking, uh, what was that last Jurassic Park movie? Fallen Kingdom? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah. Definitely. But yeah, now that we're talking about all the hallucinations and stuff, going back to my issues with Judd and his motivations, I think are so... And maybe you disagree. Maybe you totally get what Judd's all about. I just think he's confusing. Um, and I, he's just a weird. He's weird. I need more. <laughs> and what would have maybe helped is if we have scenes of the dad. We have the dad hallucinating. He does that first... Uh, he has that dream. Well, not a dream, I guess. He like walks out that door and it's the woods he wakes cool up his imagery. feet are all dirty yes that yeah. was cool i liked all of his kind of waking dreams and then we have oh yeah in the basement when he walks yes, out and gets hit cool. and falls back yeah that stuff's cool very cool good job directors more of that mm-hmm. more of that <laughs> so then you have you have the zelda stuff i would love to have seen a third type of sequence where it's judd and norma and it's norma compelling him to you know Oh, I don't know when you you would fit this in, but maybe that's why he feels so persistent. And like, we have to bury this cat tonight. Ooh. We have to bury the cat tonight. Yeah. And that could, uh, it would make when Norma shows up under the mask feel a little less yeah. out of nowhere. And then you, that, then there's more impact where mm-hmm. earlier we see her getting him to, to feel super compelled to go to the pet cemetery and to take this girl's cat there. And then you have a more of a reason that he's super weird about like, we got to bury this cat. We got to do this tonight. Mm. It's a thing. And then we see her again at the end to kind of bring that around instead of she shows up at the end and it took me a second to, Oh, okay. That's oh, that's Norma, his wife. I guess. Yeah. And that's why I had to ask, did he bury Norma in the pet cemetery? <laughs> because no, yeah. Another thing, minor thing that just could have used a little bit more of a setup is uh, it's just one line. But El- was it Elephant, the Great and Terrible? Uh-huh. They say it when they get to the house. That sounds like such a Stephen King line. Is that from the book? I don't remember, but it, it sounds like certainly such sounds Stephen like a Stephen King, King little for kid sure. writing. Definitely. Uh, but yeah, it's said later after Ellie is brought back from the dead because she says the Great and Terrible. Just have it said one more time in between there. Rule of threes. Remind us that that's a line. Because I think by the time she said it, most people had forgotten that it was said in the beginning as like a little nickname for her. It's weird. The the stuff they were doing with the zombie kid. Yeah. Was the, that's when I think the tone got out of control. It's, it's I hard to have a real scary kid. It is. Kid. Scary yeah. kids are hard to to make work. And that's what we came to the conclusion is probably the reason they changed which kid gets hit. Yeah. Because yeah. that first movie got real lucky with the baby actor they found. But even then, I think that baby is really silly. It, he is. It's a, He is wearing a little, like, weird <laughs> outfit, He's too. He's putting on the Ritz, man. He's got that. Uh, <laughs> it's like, I think there's a kid in Insidious that wears a little outfit like that, too, where he's fucking with the record player. It's just that little, like, you can imagine him holding, like, a big lollipop and, like, with a sailor hat on it's that kind of old out i don't even know what you would call it he looks like a little doll and it's he does really dumb and i think it's really funny and it's not supposed to be funny in that original movie and so yeah in this one they obviously have a lot more stuff to do for the undead child and so better stick that on like a 10 year old actor rather than a three-year-old actor or whatever the gauge kid was cute yeah but again, going back to it, man, I feel like it set a bar for Stephen King adaptations for sure. I think Stephen King is is hard to adapt 
like just looking at the history lot, of Stephen King adaptations. A lot of his books adaptations. are like internal. They are internal dialogue. Yeah, yeah. and, and that's why hard. his writing is so good. But when you just adapt that for screen, and you're going on just the basis of okay, here's the plot that happens in this mm-hmm. book. It's going to be real boring. And he wrote the screenplay for that first Pet Cemetery. Did, yeah, movie. and he's like, what, a minister in it? <laughs> yeah, he does cameos um, like a minister. But like that It adaptation, that recent one, did such a good job of having Georgie be this creepy ass kid that keeps showing up. And also, that kid actor does an amazing job of you buy, like, you understand that he's being controlled by Pennywise and that there's some, especially when he's using him as the puppet. Mm-hmm. And. Yeah, it, it's like it can be done well. The Prodigy. The Prodigy was great. Great, great. Kid. It's the same kid. Oh, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. That's why it was so good. It's just really good. I don't know why I, I'm blanking on his name, but he's very good. I think this, it just, we we did too many uh, creepy kid tropes. Yeah, because she's speaking with the like raspy voice, like, Daddy, I love you. Yeah, like, Mommy doesn't want me to be here. I don't want her to be here either. Yeah, and then it just cuts away. Like, she just said that to Lewis, and, like, I want to see his reaction. Is he going to be like, oh, Oh, well, then stay the fuck away? Yeah, Yeah, like, what? What did I do? Yeah. Oh, and then, yeah, she's dancing around in the dirty dress. I kind of like that. I did, too. I I liked when she's smashing stuff. and Mm -hmm. Because he comes down and, like, he smiles at her. Oh, my girl's back. She's dancing around. Dude, look how dirty that fucking outfit is, first off. Yeah. And then, yeah, she starts breaking shit. I also did think it was creepy when he was like, you're back. And she was like, back from where? Mm -hmm. That was a creepy line. I like that one. I liked when he was brushing her hair in the bathtub and he... So oh, all the staples gross. on the back of her head where they would have like stapled together whatever was left of her skull. After. Yeah, just a brush getting caught oh in the hair God. made me fucking cringe. That scene reminded me though when he's brushing her hair and there's like clumps of hair coming out. It just reminded me of that part in Drop Dead Gorgeous where they go visit the former beauty queen. Oh God. <laughs> and Kristen, Kirsten Dunn's just like, sh- and it's just hiding the hair like that. Oh it's no. It's so dark but that's all I can think <laughs> of is her singing a uh, don't cry out loud. <laughs> our sponsor this week is mac weldon yeah mac attack mac attack uh-huh big mac uh is a premium men's brand for for clothing and accessories and let me tell you it is premium i've gotten their stuff last time we didn't add for them i was waiting for them to arrive now i have experience with them oh, okay. holy crap this is like a follow-up this is yeah this yeah. is this is the 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 after mm-hmm. as compared to the before I love it so much. I got a hat from them, and that's oh, my workout yeah. hat. I yeah. forgot you got that from them because you've been wearing that. Um, how is that? It's great. It yeah. lets my head breathe. Yeah, I, I wear that hat every time we go work out. Keeps me from having to worry about how dumb my hair looks, and because it's naturally antimicrobial, I also don't have to worry about it smelling bad, even yeah. though I sweat a whole bunch in it. And then what? You got some underwear. Got and then... some underwear, which is also very comfortable. I was very folding great. all your clothes today, and when I that on, I think it's like what? It's like the blue camo it's underwear. Blue right? camo, yeah. I was like, damn, these. It's nice and soft. It is. It's real it's nice. nice I'm, I'm sad that I only have one pair right now because I wear it, and then I have to. I, you can't wear underwear twice in a row and so I just have to wait for laundry to be done before I can wear it again I'm gonna get more yeah because they're so comfortable and then I got those lounge pants those like Sunday lounge those pants are nice those are my go-to pants I work from home I live in those pants I'm, I'm wearing jeans right now I can't wait for us to be done filming so I can go change into those <laughs> lounge <laughs> lounge pants they're so yeah. comfortable I just want to take these pants off and wear my Mac Weldon's. Well, if you want to experience the euphoria that James is currently <laughs> like dying to experience as soon as we stop recording, you can go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off your first order uh, if you use the promo code DEADMEAT at checkout. And again, that's MacWeldon.com, 20% off your first order, promo code DEADMEAT. Yeah, it's M-A-C-K-W-E-L-D-O-N, in case you didn't know. Mac Weldon. Lots of I don't know if, if if this was intentional. I it had to have been. It's a Stephen King adaptation. Lots of nods to The Shining in this. I felt like. Well, yeah, Stephen King general nods. They always are winking at each other. There's a uh, at the birthday party. There's very 
hidden dialogue, like very lowly mixed about Cujo. Mm -hmm. I think it's John Lithgow Mm -hmm. talking about like big St. Bernard got rabies. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when Rachel is heading back, when she senses something is wrong because Lewis won't answer the phone, she's caught in a traffic jam by a sign that says dairy 20 Mm -hmm. miles away, like a mile marker. Mm -hmm. But also, yeah, the the opening immediately reminded me of the shining because it's just these driving shots and you've got Mm -hmm. the, the family and like the little kid like talking to the parents like leaning up between the seats and that kind of sweeping music and you even literally have blood coming out of an elevator and oh, yeah. <laughs> cuz there's blood coming out of the dumb waiter and that's true that's true yeah, yeah and there that picture of like Rachel and I think yep. Zelda kind of look, look like, like the twins they do yeah their their outfits are yeah. similar if not the same oh i <laughs> what did you think of how the pet cemetery looked the design of the set and stuff. The which one? The, uh, the storefront one? No, the oh, the money actual... laundering pet cemetery. Okay, um, I can't think of it. Cause I thought, and I saw some criticism about this that it looked like a set. It looked like a matte painting, which I'm I like matte paintings and I like big movie sets, but it did look kind of like a set. It actually reminded me of the beginning of Frankenstein. Oh. When they're running around and they're digging up graves and stuff. Nice. But it, I know that when they're first walking there and there's like a storm, to me it felt like the background was very fake and it kind of seemed like a a video game commercial. Uh, just the background seemed very digital and they were just walking up to it. The, the actual burial grounds themselves, I can't really picture in my head. Yeah. They're kind of like, like almost on a hilltop and there's like, like just trees in the back, but it's very open sky and there's just the fog machines going. It is. Yeah. That fog (laughs) machine was going and looked like a fog machine. But I kind of love that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, that's one thing I'll say favorably about the original Pet Cemetery movie and even the Tour de Force sequel starring Clancy Brown. Mm -hmm. Both of those movies have kick ass aerial shots of the burial grounds that like start at the ground and like zoom out and it's this huge intricate looking spiral kind of the spiral the storefront version has the spiraling graves yeah yeah the the money laundering pet cemetery has like just designs I, I, it looks very cool, and there mm-hmm. was none of that in this movie. I never got the same uh, grand sense of scale when it came to the actual burial grounds in this one. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I, yeah, you brought up how it looks. I can't even fucking picture it. That's yeah. how unmemorable it I, was. Okay. So, there's my answer. Church the Cat was oh. a fun addition, but also had a lot of people laughing at times when, again, I'm not sure if it was supposed to be laughing. I think anything with the cat supposed to be a little funny. Even the very end when it, the family's walking no. towards the car and then he hops on the car. Well, that was bad. That fucking end shot, dude. Again, I want to know whose idea that was. It's so weird. How do you not laugh at that? At That's a zombie like, family walking yeah, up Yeah, I guess it. we can talk about the tone of this because you, like the beginning... I'm getting that, oh, this is going to be like a really bleak movie. I think they were they were advertising it as a very dark movie and mm-hmm. interviews and stuff. They're and saying they used him like his his rage tears kind of like that was all over the place. Yeah. And but then once everything starts to go to shit towards the end, like after after Judd gets stabbed to shit <laughs> by that little girl and we're just turning people into it reminded me of the second pet cemetery movie because yeah. everyone is just getting dragged over to that cemetery and everyone's getting turned into zombies pretty much and it's stupid but that's what it felt like is just an endless series of people getting turned and it was funny and i don't think it was supposed to be i don't know yeah i don't know if it was or not because the theater was fucking laughing when uh, Rachel dies and is like, don't bury me there. And then cut to, yeah, Lewis gets knocked out and then zombie girl dragging the mom through the woods. Yeah. And then he comes and fights his daughter in the cemetery. And then he gets stabbed through the back, dragging him through the woods. Yeah. It's yeah. It, th- that's a funny yeah. reoccurring image. And even like the, the mom stabs him and then kind of does the, the Michael Myers head till at him. Yeah. And then they drag him away to bury him. And it just, 
feels so slapstick. Also, when he puts fucking Gage in the car after, <laughs> yeah. he's like, don't open the door for anybody. That's a baby, yeah, dude. Yeah, that's a baby. It's, <laughs> yeah, we all laughed at that, too, which, yeah. That's so fucking funny to me, is putting this baby in a car and being like, don't open don't the door open for the anyone. Door. Like, okay, I'm a baby. I won't. But I guess the baby does, on the Wikipedia, at least, it says at the end, that Gage opens the car for his family approaching them. It was supposed them. to be Gage? I guess. I thought it was the fucking dad with the little clicker. With the key beep, fob, beep. like zombie loose. That's like, what beep, I beep. thought. Either way, that's hilarious. Because, yeah, the whole family gets turned. <laughs> yeah. And they all walk up to the car together, like. Like it's a fucking Coca-Cola commercial holding yeah. hands. Yeah. And then, yeah, Church jumps up on the car. It, but Because, yeah, how does it, in the original it ends, or in, also in the book, it's he, he they, basically the dad just goes crazy. He and, he manages to kill uh, zombie cat and zombie baby, but then his wife was killed by zombie baby, and he's like, no, it'll work this time. She just died. It, it's not as long as, like, as it took me to bury my son and shit. So I'll bury her right now. I'll be fine. And he buries her, waits for her. She comes back and it cuts as she's like going to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, uh, I like that. I like that for an ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I know that in my kill count, a lot of people commented like, why would he bury it? Cause I had to condense it. He says it won't, it, it'll be different. Cause it d- doesn't take as long. Yeah. And, but that's also the, the message of the story. And, and like, that's the point of his character is he's just going to keep rationalizing. No, 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 mm-hmm. it'll work this time. Like he just is so unaccepting of, of death and wants so badly to control it that he will make up any reason to just, no, 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 it'll work this time because this, and that is what eventually kills him. But then this, I didn't really get that. Yeah. At all. It just was really silly. It kind of felt like let's do something different. What would you think about them showing the Wendigo in the woods? Did, Did you not notice it? I don't think I noticed it. Fuck, was it dude. when he was like looking and there was like a shot of the woods? It's when he's walking. What, I'm trying to think when it, because they go, they go to that fucking pet cemetery. They go back and forth a lot. So many goddamn times. It's got to be when he has Ellie. I think it is when yeah. he has Ellie and it's a wide shot. He's walking. There's a Wendigo like, and it's huge. It's like in the back. It looked like something out of the fucking ritual at Netflix. Ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. Ah, oh, fuck. How'd I miss that? Yeah. What uh, if I just imagined it? Oh. That'd be scary. Well, you know what? I'll tell you this. It, I guarantee it doesn't look as dumb as the spirit that they show briefly in the original film. You probably don't remember I this. Don't. But here, future Chelsea, you're editing this video right oh, now, no. and you're going to look up this footage, and I guarantee you it is the stupidest looking thing oh, you could God. ever is imagine. Is it practical? I don't know what it is. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, God. What is it? Is it? It looks like it came from a Pop Goes Perfection commercial, like the, the board fuck? game from the 90s. It's like this, like, head that comes out at him and is like Wah! and he like hides and then it's gone it's so brief Why but so bad that? you were probably checked out at that point probably but is that later in the movie uh, yeah it's okay. when he's going to bury gage oh okay so yeah but i'm sure aud- the audience has already seen maybe even heard it because mm-hmm. it's ridiculous it's bad I can't believe I missed the Wendigo. Because, yeah, that was pretty much absent entirely from the original film. Yeah, that's something that I, I think this one did better is that the original, I didn't understand what the deal with, like, why, like, when they come back, what has happened to them, which I guess you don't need to explain, but I think having the detail or, or this one very clearly explaining that the there's this Wendigo and it's, I, I immediately got that, oh, they're basically possessed by. Yeah. And oh, you mean when a dead person or thing comes back, they It literally possessed. is not them anymore. Yes, yes. And I, I think just in the original, I thought it's still them, but they're just pissed because they aren't dead anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or I like think... their brains just fucked up. And this one, I, I do think this one kind of has a mix because sometimes Ellie talks to Lewis about like, Like, where was I? I remember the birthday party, and it sounds like her. But then when she's attacking Judd and is like, Norma's in hell, and that, like, (laughs) that's the dialogue that is in the book. You have this creepy, 
undead Gage saying lines like that. And it's really creepy. Mm-hmm. The original film does have Gage saying over the phone to Lewis, I played with mommy and played with Judd, and now I want to play with you. And like that's creepy, but yeah, it's not quite the same sense of like, oh, that's a that's a demonic force inhabiting that undead body. Mm-hmm. Whereas you feel like that came out better in this movie. Yeah, and, and I think in the original I wasn't quite sure what is making them feel so uh, compelled to just murder? Mm-hmm, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. why are they evil when they come back? Yeah. And I, I think I was thinking of it in such a more abstract, like, oh, they're just, you know, they've had their natural death, their sleep interrupted. And also when you bring a brain back from the dead, it's probably just going to be all fucked up. Like lizard brain, yeah. I also, um, I have notes about the cats that were in this. Oh, you do? Mm-hmm. I was trying to figure out how many cats were in this. And this, you know what? This is why... This is why uh, uh, the mainstream media and why modern day journalism is a joke because no people like all these all these these articles and these sources these so called legitimate news sites can't get their shit together and tell me how many fucking cats were in this movie I saw eight I saw five and I saw four and I have no idea how many like. Why I don't saw we know? four in the credits, I think. I think it's four. I think because people... Okay, here's the thing. Because they did an interview with um one of the directors who was like, yeah, we... I thought you were going to say one of the cats. One of the cats, <laughs> yeah. I think they did an interview with one of the directors who said something like... Uh, he was being... He, he was just being kind of... Um, he was like joking and saying... Uh, you know, we oh, we were going to have such a hard time finding, like, eight cats or whatever to play this one cat. But, of course, fucking websites are reporting it as eight different cats played the... It's like... Uh, it's probably on a fucking <laughs> listicle, huh? Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> Things you missed in Best Sanitary. But, yeah, no, I think it is four cats. We have Leo, Tonic, Jaeger, and JD, and all the cats were originally shelter cats. They all got adopted after. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Which one was on the red carpet with the tie, though? I think it was i think either leo or tonic tonic's a fun name for a cat it's, yeah it's pretty cool hey, ton cat <laughs> yeah yeah I, I was reading about how uh they had to go out filming with these cats and it was like it's like getting it's like any cat you bring them somewhere new and you have to give them like hours to smell everything and and rub their face all over everything and that's what they would have to do on set is just let the cat <laughs> Walk around and smell everything. I can't imagine trying to work with a cat actor, dude. I was on one set where there was an actor cat. It was that multicam sitcom I worked on, which I shall not name because it got canceled and it was bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had, There was an actor cat in one episode and it was so cool. This cat was so well trained because it had to, in the the bit they were doing uh this cat had to jump out a window onto like a tree branch and get stuck and this cat would just over and over again jump from the windowsill up into the tree and sit there Aww. it was so cute we can't even i bought a fucking heating pad for lucy we can't even get her to lay on it she laid on it last night that's good yeah good because normally <laughs> she just lays on pieces she of likes paper. to lay on paper i don't know why <laughs> i did write <laughs> that one scene where it's it's when uh so I hear like a bird outside just just like, alone. Oh, it's just alone. <laughs> <laughs> See no, I that's not a Judd voice. It's John Lithgow's voice was so craggly. I know, but I did love the scene. I'll get back to what I was about to talk about real quick. But uh <laughs> when he comes over and Church jumps in his lap <laughs> yeah. and Gage is like, Good kitty and then <laughs> John Lithgow's like, Oh yes, Church is a good kitty. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, you sounded just like that. Thank you. Oh, I did. I just wanted. I wanted more of those moments of him with the family, and and you know, because you don't get his. You don't get why he's so attached, right? See, away. I think, and you said that both versions of Judd are weird. You, I think Fred Gwynn's version, you do get that. I felt very much the love between Fred Gwynn and and the Creeds. But yeah, so that other scene with Judd, where it's when the dad decides i'm gonna go dig up ellie and they he goes over with like a bunch of booze to oh, and- to judd's house and like spikes his drink and i in the, when he wakes up on the lawn and he's got like a blanket over him and i for some reason i didn't realize like he hadn't moved 
in my head, I just thought, oh my God, he did like the mattress prank with John Lithgow where like your friend gets super drunk. And so you take whatever they fell asleep on, like a, the mattress or like a couch co- and you put them on the front lawn. Oh, I haven't I- done, but that, that just is like classic frat prank, bro. I thought he did. <laughs> Like you imagine doing that to fucking judge. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go bury my kid in the zombie graveyard. But first, yeah, this would be a r- fun prank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the cemetery is just like, hey. Also, this would be really funny. <laughs> yeah, it compels him to do that, and also put like his hand in a cup of warm yeah, water. <laughs> yeah, that would see. I think yeah, that's more fun if you're gonna be an all powerful spirit and you can make people do stuff. Just do pranks instead. I will say that he he drugs Judd and Judd passes out outside, and then it cuts to where Rachel is and it's raining. But I didn't realize the rain was where she was at first, and I was like, Judd's gonna get <laughs> Judd's gonna drown. Gonna get something. pneumonia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Um. So she goes back to her parents', parents house. house. Yes. Why? Because she's sad. But, well, do you want to live in the house where your kid just got? No, but you're going to go to the house where your sister died and that... you're super traumatized by even thinking about it. Sure. That doesn't make any sense. I thought to about me. that too. Yeah. But also they need to get her out of there so that he can dig up Ellie. It, yeah. It's plot stuff. Do we ever see her family in this movie? You do. Her dad has uh, very white hair. Is he at the birthday party? He or is, and he's uh, he gives Lewis a glare as he puts Rachel in the car to drive her back to his house. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. There isn't a funeral scene where uh, he gets into a fist fight with Lewis, though, because that happens in the original film. Oh, And okay. the book. They get into a fight and knock over Gage's casket. and his That's dead. right. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. God, that's fucked up. It is fucked up, dude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that. Mm-hmm. Was Judd smoking weed this whole movie? <laughs> I, it looks like joints. It's got to be hand-rolled cigarettes. He's an old man. I know, but it's so much funnier if he's just high <laughs> just as fuck high as this fuck. whole time. Yo, Lewis, this fucking cemetery, dude. Because <laughs> at first, I because he was smoking during one scene, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be so funny if he's just smoking joints? But then they do a close-up, and he's holding it with his like, thumb like a and his forefinger, and I'm like... Wait, is he just getting high this whole time? He's an old man I in a it's, rural it's state. It's got to be yeah. hand rolled cigarettes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, my va- <laughs> just to close this out. My very last note is, oh no, this is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird ending. We do though. I I when the credits started rolling, I did jokingly start singing the Pet Cemetery song, that Ramon song. Mm-hmm. But then it, a cover of it did actually start playing, so didn't I look foolish? <laughs> yeah, and another thing, this movie starts with the ending. It starts with that like shot yeah, why? of, I don't know. Like, oh, the house on fire and there's blood everywhere. I guess it's supposed to be intriguing of like, how did this happen? We'll show you. Yeah, well, we all know Pet Cemetery. If you're going to see this, you probably... Well, who knows? Who knows, man? Yeah. World. I don't know. I just... Yeah. I think overall, <laughs> this was very meh. Yeah. It's weird. Before it was released, I heard nonstop, like, raving Same. reviews that it was, like, the best horror movie of the year. And then after it came out, I heard much more mixed reviews. And seeing it myself, uh, yeah, it... I don't hate it. No, I, like I, I said, I like it more than the original movie. It's it's a better version of that. It's mm-hmm. just still not like a great movie. Yeah, I just think it's really forgettable, mm-hmm. which sucks. I would love to see a good version of this story. Yeah, but I think like if you want to watch Pet Cemetery, you can watch this one and not the original, and you're you're fine. Hmm. I mean, I, Fred Gwynn's performance I was is say, worth though, seeing. Sometimes yeah. dead is better. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> I think I think maybe just watch the original for Fred Gwynn. Ooh. Yeah. All right. I'll say it. Okay. I mean, both of them have really good cats. Yeah. The first one does have the cat getting tucked into bed. That's right. This one doesn't have this that. This one does not have that. Nope. None of those four cats could fucking do that. What the fuck? I know. Tonic, <laughs> Jaeger, JD, you couldn't do that? You couldn't get under the blanket? Mm-hmm. Bullshit. Well, that about does it for this. 
next week. Oh my God. Yeah. Next week is going to be so fun because we're going to have, can we say? Yeah, we can say it. Yeah. Uh, Jonah Ray's coming on the podcast, what which the is awesome. That's so and crazy. we're going to, we're going to talk about a movie. I guess I'll, I'll leave it a surprise, but oh, we yeah? Pick, yeah, we picked out a movie. Well, you know, you know what? Maybe we should say so that people can watch it mm-hmm. and then uh, we're going to watch a, a brain dead slash dead alive. Yeah. The uh, Peter Jackson horror movie which we've both seen but forever ago i don't really remember much and of it. shockingly is not available on blu-ray except i think there's like a 150 dollar blu-ray oh i did not get that i got the dvd so we'll be watching it in standard definition but uh yeah apparently our restoration is coming eventually but hmm. for now we're gonna have to watch it in standard definition it's an old ass new zealand movie and i remember it feeling like uh yeah, like it, an old ass new zealand oh, yeah. movie so that's exciting that's gonna be so fun so, yeah. yeah well uh yeah you have that to look forward to in the meantime in between time you can follow dead meat on social media at dead meat james on twitter and instagram and i'm at carebeck c-r-e-b-e-c-c on twitter and instagram and if you want merch deadmeatstore.com mm-hmm. shoot us any emails at deadmeatpod at gmail.com yeah, i think we're out of final girl pens i'm working on oh. getting them we're changing we're, we're like changing around some warehousing stuff again because yep. running a store is complicated yeah so Who knew? they'll be back in stock at some point they'll be there yeah uh yeah until next week i'm james i'm chelsea and this has been the deadmeat podcast <laughs>